Hi, Theo. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, Dashan. Thank you for doing this. So uh, let's see, just to give some context, uh, we've been mutuals <laughs> for a while, but uh, you've been leading IFS and core transformation sessions for folks. And uh, I've mm -hmm. done both of those with you and found them really fruitful. So wanted to talk to you more about uh, your background and your experience leading those sessions and really anything else that we uh, dive into. So maybe just to start, could you share mm -hmm. uh, a bit about your background and life story? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm a 27 year old guy from India and until 2019, I used to work in the finance industry and I got disillusioned with that world very soon. And I quit that job to explore and carve out my own path. And initially my latent interest in psychology and the need for a source of income drew me towards the world of marketing. And while skilling myself in that domain, I was reading up a lot on human nature, what makes us tick, why we do what we do, why we feel what we feel. And so yeah, over the last two, three years, I did a lot of freelance marketing, copywriting stuff. And simultaneously around the same time, um, because my interest was peaked into self-exploration, I started trying to resolve my own emotional hangups because there were quite a few of them. And so that's roughly the background. And I, I've mostly had a, what I would say, a good life. I haven't really had to struggle a lot in any sense. I've had very supportive parents, very supportive environment all around, uh, got things easily. Of course, there have been moments of suffering and my own personal struggles, but yeah, I've never really had to struggle a lot internally. So. I already had a good foundation to work with. It was just about finding that resonance about what I want to do in life. And it seems like I'm starting to find it now. So yeah, excited to see where this part takes me. Mm -hmm. And when you started exploring your sort of emotional hangups and uh, what, um, what did you do to explore that? Yeah, yeah. So initially it was classic self-help stuff trying to fix your habits, trying to um, coerce yourself into doing the right things, coerce yourself into doing meditation because it is good for you. And so a lot of mainstream stuff and some of it worked. Of course, it has some benefits and it adds some positive effect to your life. But the emotional patterns stayed the same more or less. And while trying to figure this out, I landed in this part of Twitter that we all love so much. And you see so many kind people working with so many powerful modalities, eager to help and very curious, very open to conversations. And so I met many other self-exploration nerds along the way who pointed me in a lot of useful directions. And so, yeah, in 2020, I got really serious about the whole idea of healing my childhood trauma. And so I started getting serious about meditation, started experimenting with psychedelics and unconventional therapeutic modalities and often combining these in idiosyncratic ways. And along the way, just talking to other people who are on the same journey, reading books, working with some coaches and just a lot of experiments and seeing what works, what doesn't work a lot of trial and error and yeah, a lot of relational healing in my personal life, stuff like that. And internal family systems has been one of the things that you've explored. How did you start to get interested in that? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in I think mid last year, I stumbled upon this podcast where Richard Schwartz talked to Tim Ferriss and until then, I had heard about IFS being mentioned by a lot of people in this corner of Twitter, and I was curious about it. And this podcast seemed like a good entry point. I really liked Tim Ferriss, Richard Schwartz, the inventor of IFS, seemed like the perfect conversation to get introduced to IFS. And that is such a powerful podcast. They even do a live demo on the podcast episode where Richard Schwartz helps Tim Ferriss explore his childhood abuse. 
and it was very emotionally moving and you also get some glimpses of your own parts when Richard Schwartz is guiding Tim Ferriss along the way and yeah from that point I was so intrigued and also like noticing how Tim Ferriss just noticing the big shift in Tim Ferriss voice and way of being in that audio podcast was a big indicator that something powerful was happening there. And from there, I then picked up the book Self Therapy by Jay Early to figure out how to do IFS on my own. And then I did a coaching session with Matt Goldenberg. And that was my first real experience with IFS. Until then, IFS was more of a theoretical thing because I, I had only heard about it or seen other people do it. But when your parts talk back to you the first time and reveal things to you that are so true, but you never thought of and all these insights landing for you and things resolving emotionally. Yeah, it was very surreal to experience and I was hooked from that point and just started to doing a lot of solo FS work and uh, I also got a friend of mine interested in it. So we would take turns holding space for each other. What were some of the things that came up for you or that you had to work through as you started applying internal family systems? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing, and when I was initially trying to get hold of at least one part, anger seemed like an accessible emotion to work with because there's, there's always something we are frustrated, irritated or angry about. Uh, and yeah, so that seemed like a good entry point. And I got access to my angry part who had like years and years of suppressed rage, who wasn't really open for a dialogue. It was just mad at anyone and everyone. And closely related to this was my people pleasing part, and which had avoided confrontations, avoid taking up space, avoiding expressing my needs and wants. And this is where a lot of anger and resentment came from. And the angry part was specifically held a lot of anger towards this people pleasing part. And so this was the first dynamic that I got to explore through internal family systems. And then getting access to the pain underneath that and experiencing all the origins of hurt, all the times that I had been bullied or humiliated or felt small and going through all that unburdening that pain and noticing a real felt shift where the angry part transformed from this in my visual headspace. I'm a very visual person. So it transformed from a red angry part with a pitchfork to a warrior, a calm collected warrior in a black suit. And th this initiated a shift for me that lasted months then slowly moved to a place where I could be, take up more, feel comfortable taking up more space, expressing my needs and wants. And yeah, just in general, being more assertive. And for yourself and your own practice, uh, mm -hmm. do you tend to use internal family systems and other modalities on your own, or do you find it useful to be facilitated or how do you approach that personally? Yeah, I find it very useful to have it facilitated because I feel to go deep, to really get to the pain, it's useful if someone's holding space for you. Because if you're doing it on your own, it's easy to get up, get caught up in your train of thoughts, get derailed. And if you're also doing it on your own, you have to constantly self-monitor and intellectualize. You have to make assumptions and deductions, which are often judgmental in nature about other parts. And these are all disruptive of doing the process. Uh, I still believe that you can do IFS on your own and you can get very far. It's just that it's much easier if someone's holding space for you and prompting you with questions or just mirroring back what you're saying. And I believe sitting down for two hours or 90 minutes or something like that is the big challenge. If you can do that in, on your own, that, then you'll definitely get quite far. But yeah, it's hard to do that on your own without getting lost. If someone's holding space for you, you can go for really long and that allows you to go really deep. So yeah, uh, I 
try to work with coaches from time to time but other than that just having my friends hold space for me is very useful are there any skills that you had to develop along the way as you started using these modalities yeah um if if you call meta a skill yes that that has been a very useful skill in cultivating this feeling of loving kindness which increases the self energy that you bring to your parts so uh, when i started my healing journey i felt that meta meditation aligned very well with ifs it aligned well with um, altering your state of consciousness and bunch of other things so meta was my main form of meditation practice for a long time for entirety of 2021 and yeah so that that has been a very useful skill then yeah i think in general just sitting down and staying with your body and feelings as a general skill has been very useful uh i explored focusing a bit then moved away from it and have come back to it now because i feel it adds a lot to any therapeutic modality just being able to get a clear bodily awareness of your felt sense that's very useful then yeah i think other than this i think some perspectives being exposed to a lot of useful perspectives through twitter or through podcasts ends up being very useful when you're trying to converse with your parts and trying to get them to see things in a different light and so yeah these are some of the skills at the top of my head that have been very useful hmm. and how has your internal experience changed over time as you've been applying these modalities yeah so one thing that stands out very clearly for me is that over time the resistance that my parts offer to the process has reduced significantly initially i had to work through a lot of parts who would derail the process who would interrupt who would not trust what i was trying to do and so i had to do a lot of back and forth with these parts to get somewhere and what happens is as you show up more and more for your parts with all your heart and consistently they start trusting you and they also see the results of all the inner work that you have been putting in they see that you do care about their wants and needs and that you can actually skillfully get them met and so they start relinquishing control slowly and you develop what uh, ifs calls self leadership and so this has become very clear now i've got to a point where uh, my protectors barely, barely offer any resistance to me going into pain if they feel that i have a safe container physically and relationally they directly let me access the pain underneath and so so basically the emotional fluidity has increased a lot uh sometimes it feels like walking around with an open heart because uh your protectors are just let go sometimes to let you feel the pain but yeah this has been the biggest change over time and it continues to get more and more fluid for me and what led you to start facilitating sessions yourself yeah so uh towards the end of last year a friend approached me to guide a session for her um i was like sure why not and i did that i really enjoyed that and noticed that i had a knack for it i really enjoyed doing that and i could do it skillfully even while just having read one book and ha- having no training i started doing more of it um just a small set of friends sometimes a friend of friend or something like that and yeah initially i was hesitant to offer this to other people because i was like hey i am not a licensed therapist or a trained coach who am i to do this for other people and so yeah i'm just never really i didn't know how to start and in march this year i sent out a tweet randomly saying hey if anyone would like to experience ifs with me please feel free to reach out and i didn't I, i didn't really expect that to lead into something but then a few people reached out those people then tweeted about their experiences which then led to more people reaching out to me and yeah this just 
continued and since april 2022 i have guided over 100 sessions and yeah i met so many people continued to deepen my practice and now it feels very much like my calling so doubling down on it congratulations on leading so many sessions that's that's amazing and i know both of the Thank sessions you. that i've done with you have been very powerful so it makes me happy to think about uh you know, that being offered to so many people. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm curious, how do you think about that sort of dynamic now of not having formal training or certification and yet offering these services? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So even then, a part of me uh, has a very anti-establishment or anti-gatekeeping feelings. Uh, I feel like if you are skilled at something, you should not require credentials to be able to offer that service. But I'm sure uh, there's a good reason for those credentials and there's arguments that can be made on the other side. But uh, what has changed now is this confidence after having guided 100 sessions, receiving validation from so many people, some of which are really smart at what they do, some of them who have put in hundreds or thousands of hours uh, into their own inner work like you. And also noticing that I am skilled at this. I, I am able to facilitate transformative experiences for people. So it's getting this confidence that I have something valuable to offer and I could lean into it. What advice would you give your past self before you started facilitating or that might be useful to someone in a similar position? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I got really lucky in a lot of ways. Um, this community that we are part of is very supportive and I got a great break uh, by so many people trusting me and so I think just showing up in public space, learning in public, uh, sharing your ideas and thoughts and not being hesitant to offer your gift. I think that's a good starting point. And I think even a better starting point is the people around you who already trust you. And yeah, my friends definitely played a big role in me being able to facilitate this for other people. And so, no matter what you're trying, there are people in life who probably already trust you and who would, if you ask them, they would be more than happy to yeah, be guinea pigs for you. Mm. And other than that, I think working with other coaches uh, is also very useful, getting a sense of how this unfolds, how you can go about it, what to keep in mind, how to structure it. So working with Matt Goldenberg did that for me to a certain extent getting a sense of how something like this unfolds. And yeah, I think just finding a way to put in a lot of reps is very useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. As you put in those reps with the sessions that you've led, were there any skills that you noticed yourself developing in facilitating these experiences? Yeah. Uh, one thing I had to get good at was staying in self myself as I was trying other people as trying to help other people stay in self. And uh, initially I noticed uh, I would sometimes get frustrated if the session was not really unfolding smoothly or if the other person was not able to follow what I was trying to say and getting in touch with this part and reassuring its concerns, explaining that part or just considering that part to relax and welcome whatever's going on. Uh, so, and things like these keep happening. A distracted part often comes in and takes my attention in different directions, especially if something interesting is happening for the other person. I start thinking meta about, oh, how I could integrate this in my other sessions and that can take me away from being present for the other person. And so small things like that where uh, learning to be attentive to the other person and being attuned to them while being attentive. So this is a skill that I think I'm continuing to develop. I think there's no ceiling on how good you can get at this. Then 
I think patience in general, I have developed a lot of patience uh, because sometimes the session's not really going, unfolding smoothly or uh, there's a lot of back and forth. There's this feelings of disconnection. And in that moment, if you get impatient, it just makes it worse. And sometimes you, what the success of session comes down to it is just staying with the struggle, the staying with the resistance. And so patience as a skill, yeah, I've really developed that skill and I feel really proud about how patient I have become in general in life, in my conversations. Amazing. I think, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, just adjusting that. I wonder if, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in hearing you about patience because I think that that's uh, like a virtue that I could stand to cultivate myself. And I'm just curious if you have any advice about how to cultivate that as a virtue. Yeah. Yeah, whenever there's, I, I, I picked this up from Demonic, Demonic Hugger on Twitter. He had a tweet uh, long ago, which went like, rather than asking, how can I become more confident or how can I become more patient? Could you reframe the question as what's stopping me from being confident or what's stopping me from being patient? And so, and that, that will be unique to each one of us, what's making us impatient. And for me, I noticed my impatience came from a place of wanting faster resolutions quicker results, smoother process, and, and then further going underneath it, why did I want those things? And it's not just specific to IFS, but in general in life, I feel that uh, I have this tendency to want faster resolutions and to heal fast so that I can get the things that I want and so that I can, uh, it's this, achievement mindset being brought into inner work and underneath for me underneath that was this want to be the guy who has it all figured out or who has everything sorted so that I'm valuable to other people and just wanting certainty in general and then trying to work with those feelings and tracing them back to where they originated and unburdening that has been helpful and so that is when all the sources of impatience start dropping away. It cultivates the space for freedom to just nurture and evolve. That's helpful, thank you. Um, coming back to IFS, I'm curious if, as you led all of these sessions, uh, mm -hmm. if there were any sort of edges that you discovered to IFS as it was presented to you or things that didn't quite feel like it fit or um, sort of new ways of seeing that unfolded for you that uh, you yeah. had that weren't like explained in the way that IFS tends to present things. Yeah. Um, it has the details of what IFS actually presents have blurred out for me and over guiding these hundred sessions, I've improvised in many ways that uh, and I don't know what is originally part of IFS and what is what I have added to it. I've also added what I've seen other coaches do or what I've little things from other modalities. And uh, how I see IFS is that IFS is very, very useful to get you to the pain. And from there, I think you can just bring in a lot of different modalities, whichever works best for you to unburden that pain. And so IFS has general steps or IFS, at least how J. Early talks about it has some steps that are definitely useful, like witnessing the origins of hurt, then reimagining that event in a way where you were able to give yourself that embodied sense of safety, rescuing the exile from that situation and bringing it to the present. And yeah, there's a ritualistic step uh, in that book by Jirli, 
which goes something like releasing the burden to one of the four natural elements, which I really like. And so these are the things that have stayed with me. But other than that, I think, uh, for example, bringing in some focusing when you have access to the pain, locking in the felt sense of how that thing feels in the body. I think that's very useful. And then bioemotive framework by Douglas Tatarin. I think that's really useful. So what IFS recommends is to stay unblended from your exile and to not blend in with the pain and just help the part from a distance. And the bioemotive framework, the Nedera process is contrast with that in the sense that you blend in with it and allow it to move you to the point it triggers sobbing. And I feel that's really, really helpful. Um, sobbing is a great outlet for somatic release and it can unburden so much pain. So I think if you are able to do that in a safe way, that is a very good move that IFS doesn't really talk about. Then, yeah, ideal parent figure protocol. I think what IFS recommends is letting the self do the reparenting, but I noticed that, for example, what you lacked was a mother's care and affection. And if you are a man, then maybe you could model that affection in some way through what the capital S self that IFS talks about. But bringing in your ideal parents, allowing your imagination to model an ideal set of parents, an ideal mother, I think that can be really useful. And what, what, what's also useful is as you, the more modalities that you have at your disposal, it also increases your degree of freedom. Uh, you can be very flex, flexible and more attuned to what you need in that moment and then pick a tool that is more appropriate for what you need. Definitely. Yeah. How do you think about the relationship between meta loving kindness and internal family systems? Oh, yeah. I think meta and IFS are very synergistic and IFS can enhance your meta meditation and also vice versa. So I have noticed this thing that I do intuitively that when I sit down for meta meditation and if resistance comes up for me in offering love to a certain individual or just offering, just feeling resistance in offering to myself or in general or resistance in the form of distraction or dissociation, this is where IFS can be really useful to help you move through that resistance, basically offering meta to that resistance as well. And this then unlocks your ability to give love to your parts, which then translates into when you're sitting down for an IFS exploration. If you have this training to offer love to your parts, to just offer love in general, feel love in general for yourself, this can increase the self energy that you bring to your parts and it can make things very smooth and make it easier for the part to trust you. And it can also create the ideal conditions, basically an embodied sense of emotional safety where it's safe for pain to come up to the surface. Is there anything that you wish you had known when you started uh, doing love and kindness practice yourself? Yeah, uh, so I tried Meta a couple of times and bounced off it before actually going deep into it. And so for me, John Verbecki's uh, lecture on Meta really made a big difference because he explains Meta uh, and love in general as an existential stance. Well, he explains meta first as uh, how it's a hybrid term of loving kindness and there's no clear English translation for it and how uh, it's not just about emotion, but both it's a virtue, right? It's a way of being, it's an affordance to be able to be a certain way. And what we're trying to do with meta is learn to take on this existential stance where we are more open to the other person or to reality in general, which puts us in this uh, process of reciprocal knowing 
And just being exposed to those perspectives helped me realize how nuanced and deep meta actually is. It's not just about generating positive emotions. Positive emotions are a tool through which we get this existential stance of loving kindness, which opens us up to transformation. So that really clicked from me. Uh, and oh, another instruction in that lecture by John Verbeke is this idea that every time we are thinking of some other person or interacting with some other person, we automatically assign a role to them and ourselves. For example, if you're talking to your father, uh, you take on the role of a son and he takes on the role of a father. But what Meta can allow us to do is help us uh, go beyond this thing that John Verbeke calls the agent arena relationship. And noticing that that person is not just your father, it's uh, a human being with rich history and he's also a son, he's also a husband, he's also a brother perhaps. And this thing really landed for me and it deepened my practice so much. I wish I knew it when I first came across Meta. And so just when you're offering Meta to the people in your lives and noticing that they are not just what the role they play in your life, but they are so much more. And it automatically increases your empathy for them. It automatically helps you love them more easily and see how much richness everyone is carrying in their inner life. Can you say more about why that uh, awareness of people's different roles was helpful to you personally? Yeah, um, I think the instruction clearly landed for me uh, in context of my parents. Uh, it's natural for us to just see our parents as just our parents. And uh, because there's usually some form of baggage in that relationship, or even if there's no baggage, because you are so used to seeing your parents as just your parents, interacting with them as just as if they are parents. And, and because it's the oldest relationship, you have now used to interacting in the same way with them. And, but noticing that he's not just my father or she's not my, just my mother, she's also a daughter, he's also a son. And, he, he had his own struggle. He probably has his own struggles. And there's so much that I don't know about him. There's so much that I could talk to him about just having this affordance. Yeah, I think it makes a big difference, especially in case of parents. In case of friends, we are already friends. So we don't assign strict roles to our friends, even though that can happen. But with family, I think we end up assigning these roles to ourselves and them and then operate in that strict constraints often. When you facilitate sessions, what's sort of the structure of a session with you? Yeah. Uh, so it goes something like, we start, if I'm working with someone new, we take some time to get to know each other. Um, I give them some background about what I'm up to, why I'm doing this, and what I'm hoping to get out of it. And uh, then I try to understand their context, what's alive for them, what they are trying to nurture or untangle, uh, what disturbs them. and what their self-exploration journey has been like so far, if they have any experience with IFS or any other adjacent modality. And then I walk them through the process. If they are not familiar with IFS, I give them an overview of the model and describe how the process could unfold. Then, yeah, I walk them through the process and my approach goes something like this. Uh, I see my role as to, at a high level, create a container for the other person where they can go inside and do the exploration. And I serve as a guide from the outside, helping them where they get stuck, mirroring back what they are saying and just holding space for them. And to do this to the best of my ability, I try to take care of a few things. Like uh, the most important is staying in self for both the other person and me as well. So noticing when 
they might blend in with other parts and describing them how i will help them stay in self how they might blend in with other parts and how they can alert me about this then yeah giving them question prompts along the way to get to know their parts better so that they don't have to intellectually think about what to ask or what to how to navigate the process and they can let go and just focus on being present for their parts i take some rough notes along the way to help them so that they don't have to worry about keeping track of things and they can go inside and yeah i give my inputs and perspectives where they might be useful and appropriate and other than this i see the core of my approach as this thing that i picked up from joe hudson who has the art of accomplishment series uh, this idea called loving the resistance and the thing is any kind of evolution requires resistance there is no life without resistance and any kind of inner work will naturally bring up resistance especially if you are trying to approach some emotional pain and i believe the success of session comes down to just being sensitive to your resistance and inviting it in often we have the tendency to ignore the resistance or push through it or resist it or just give up in the face of resistance but what i focus on is if there's any kind of resistance if there's any feeling of disconnect then that's important piece of information that's a part trying to say something to you and we need to invite that part in and hear that part out and resistance can look like restlessness distraction skepticism judgment dissociation your visuals blanking out or your body going numb it can also be interpersonal resistance for example uh someone might feel like i'm rushing things someone might feel like a part of them might not be okay with opening up to me or something i said does not resonate with them and if these things get ignored they get layered on top of each other and that derails the process but if we can acknowledge these things and invite those part in make them feel heard then the resistance can melt away and if the resistance melt away slowly all you have to do from that point on is just lead from your heart and the process becomes very superfluous so yeah i think even in solo ifs practice if you can become sensitive to the nature of your own resistance if you know how resistance usually shows up for you and if you develop a relationship with those parts it can be it can get radically easier for you to do ifs on your own hmm. Hmm. when you think back on sessions that you feel have gone very well where you're really able to uh, mm -hmm. help facilitate a transformative experience for someone i'm curious if there are any sort of skills that you notice people bringing to that where it seems like they're able to uh make best use of that the session and like um yeah sort of skills that people might be able to develop to help facilitate these experiences oh yeah uh i think this relates to the skill that i have personally found useful in my journey which we talked earlier about but the common patterns i have noticed across sessions that have been really well is one uh, if the other person has some form of contemplative practice it becomes very apparent in during the session because things just flow more smoothly for them they have some practice sitting with themselves sitting with their emotions without getting disturbed and i think this makes a big difference then uh other than this being familiar with the ifs model and doing some self experimentation gives you some idea of what it can look like and what also helps a lot is so the idea is that everyone has different ways of communicating with their own parts and everyone has a different phenomenology some people have no visuals at all some people have vivid visuals some people can talk non verbally to their parts some people very much rely on thoughts and words and so if you know what is it that works for you what's your communication channel for talking to yourself for talking to your parts then 
you can jump right in you can quickly get into it and start talking to your parts otherwise uh, you might have to spend some time getting a hang of it what is it what's the way that your parts talk to you or how you can talk to them and it also helps if you have uh, experience with more than one communication channel for example if you can non verbally offer meta to your parts in your body or if you can visually imagine a good setting for them or if you can if you have did a lot of if you have done a lot of journaling that also translates well because you have journaling is basically talking to your parts right in a non structured way so you have if you have done a lot of talking to your parts that also translates well to ifs hmm 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 are there any ways that uh someone might use turning practice intentionally to complement internal family systems sorry what practice uh journaling and internal oh, family journaling. systems oh yeah uh i think journaling as well as uh, what some people do is talking out loud in a voice recorder just allowing your parts basically giving your parts a pen or the tape recorder and letting them speak and i i saw someone tweeting about this it's not mine but yeah uh, it's something that really resonated and you can let your parts take over and speak out loud uh, i recently installed this app that i haven't really used it's called the anter app a n t e r where you can create sub personalities and you can then chat with yourself with those sub personalities of you and it also stores those chats so that seems like an interesting way to talk to your parts mm. Yeah, I, I really like Antar. I, I've uh, used it in the past, and I've also done similar things mm -hmm. in uh, just a Google Doc and like sort of mm -hmm. almost like a screenplay of like oh different different oh, uh, nice. parts like that. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. how's the Antar app different from for you compared to when you do IFS with your eyes closed, trying to talk to your parts? Like, is does this feel similar or hmm. very different? Um, I think, um, you were talking earlier about how, when you facilitate a session or when you are being facilitated yourself, that, uh, it sort of opens up more. And, um, yeah. uh, I think that's been my experience as well that, um, you know, because I've practiced these different skills, there's sort of, uh, things that I'm able to do for myself and I do those mm -hmm, mm -hmm. often, but then yeah. there's sort of new territory or things that are more difficult yeah. to work with then um facilitating is helpful and i think antar is kind of useful for that as well just like seeing it on the page mm -hmm. oh, yeah. creates a kind of distance that um uh like can support things that maybe are trickier or harder to work with for whatever reason yeah 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 i think what it probably also helps with is uh having a linear flow because doing it in your head can be very non-linear and it can go in different directions simultaneously and becomes hard to keep track of and that something like journaling or that app you have a flow and even if you get distracted you can quickly recap what has unfolded and resume from there yes definitely hmm. i know it's been a more recent thing that you've been exploring but um i'd mm -hmm. be curious to hear about um your experiences with Core transformation, both practicing it yourself and starting to facilitate it. Yeah, um, my introduction to core transformation was this blog post by Romeo Stevens, and I think there are a lot of interesting tweets by Romeo Stevens on core transformation. If you just search his profile, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. He also talks about how it's an old Vajrayana practice that was adopted by NLP practitioners, something along those lines. So that's very interesting. Uh, Anyway, that was that blog post was really interesting. It really resonated with me. And he has a very useful protocol summary linked at the bottom of the blog post. And so that was my entire introduction to core transformation. And so far, I haven't really gone beyond it. But yeah, it's, it's such a simple technique on its face, but it's so powerful in what it's able to make you experience. And yeah the contrast with ifs is also very interesting right uh, it's it seems very much parts work but with ifs what we are trying to do is 
uh, try to understand what the part is scared of, what is it that the part does not want you to feel, and then going into that feeling and allowing yourself to feel it and then unburden it. So basically, we are going into the pain. And with core transformation, we are doing kind of the opposite. We are asking the part what it wants and then recursing on that to get to the deeper want and eventually through the deepest want, which leads to some form of core state. And so this is something that you really want to feel, but it's buried beneath all these series of intended outcomes that you think you have to go through, that you think you have to earn that core state. And it, it's also very light compared to IFS, which can get dark and heavy sometimes if you're going into pain. Core transformation is much more lighter in comparison, but it brings up so many interesting conflicts in your head. Uh, and it's very interesting how one random thing connects to entirely different thing. For example, you start exploring, for example, from a recent exploration of mine, I started exploring this need for validation. And as I went deeper and deeper into it, uh, I noticed a part had objections to feeling me, me feeling some positive emotion. So that was interesting to explore. And then, uh, I got to a want of just being, and then another part had uh, had conflicts with that want because just being will expose you to certain risks that the part is not okay with. So it's it gives you a lot of insight into how your like various wants are connected to each other in ways that you don't realize. And so that's, that's been really useful. And what has been specifically useful for me and something that I've also noticed in the limited practices, limited sessions that I have guided for the people is that core transformation seems to be especially useful for working with feelings of lack. And so with IFS, you can work with feelings of lack, but it's what it's more useful for is negative incident traumas where something wrong happened and now you can go relive that and reimagine it in a different way. But something like feelings of lack, which is about what did not happen, what you did not get, it's a bit tricky to explore with IFS. This is where core transformation can especially be useful. And I've also found it useful when certain parts have the objection that we do not have the required internal resources to undertake this process or to heal. And so, working with those parts and helping them get in touch with this core state, this infinite source of joy, love, bliss within them. I think that ends up being very helpful. And yeah, the other thing that I've found very useful, again, in my limited experimentation is working with shadowy parts. So these are the parts that are overcompensating in a way for what you missed out on in your childhood, but they do it in a way where they sometimes enjoy it, sometimes revel in it. And the idea of unburdening the pain does not really appeal to them. They are more interested in accumulating power. They are more interested in just, yeah, accumulating resources, power, stuff like that. And so starting with one of those parts and going deeper and deeper and deeper, and getting to the core state that is the wholesome want behind their unwholesome want is very interesting. And then working your way back up and noticing how their want change. That's very interesting. Hmm. What would an example of that be uh, where the, like where the want might transform after you've had contact with the core state? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think take something like this want for influence or power. And I have that to a certain extent, I've explored that influence specifically. And it comes from uh, not having felt heard early in my childhood or not having taken seriously or 
feeling alienated. And for me, IFS hasn't really been that useful uh, for exploring this. And core transformation worked in an interesting way where that want went to uh, the deeper want beneath that was feeling belonged. And then the deeper want behind feeling belonged was a sense of safety. Um, the deeper want beneath that was I don't know, just peace. And then it went on and on. And I, I got to this state of just being. And then when you can experience that fully and then start working your way back up, yeah, it's just that if you already have this, if you can already just be, you also realize that it's the best way of connecting with people. It's the best way of actually building deep connections, which is actually the best way of acquiring influence if you even want that now. So that's a rough example of, from my broken memory right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you understand these core states, like what they are and why they would be present at all? Yeah, yeah that's a very fascinating question. And honestly, I don't know. I can try to speculate. I think there's definitely some parallels between what IFS calls the self and these core states. There might be some connection. I also think it is very much connected to our true state of being. Uh, if you peel away all the layers, what remains is this source of infinite love, joy, bliss. And also if you have experienced non-dual of something like non-dual awareness through different modalities, uh, you notice that you do have the innate capacity to experience these states. It's just covered up beneath many layers. And so I feel that what core transformation might be enabling is peeling away of those layers until we get to that core state and then realizing that it was here all along, something like that. But yeah, honestly, I don't know. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I know you also have talked some about psychedelics and uh, their relationship with these practices. Is there anything you'd like to say about uh, maybe just starting by talking about your own experiences with them? Yeah, yeah. It's a topic that's very much close to my heart. And it's one of the reasons that I'm currently staying anonymous. Uh, I, I want my life's work to revolve around these substances in some way. I don't know how, I don't know why. I, I, I know, I, I, I'm not sure how that will play out. But yeah, um, I think the single best intervention for me has been working with MDMA. And my gateway drug was, of course, Nick Camerata. <laughs> and yeah, the, the way he talked about the substance, like it can get you really curious about it. and. So yeah, I had my first MDM experiences in experience in August last year. And yeah, from the first experience, it was clear that this was something radically powerful. What it enables in a solo therapeutic setting is something that nothing else enables. It increases the emotional safety, this feeling of love within you to a radically high degree, which just creates this big safety net for you to go to the darkest places in your mind and unburden the pain. And yeah, so an IFS is also very synergistic with MDMA. And I think the MAPS protocol talks about how a lot of patients who are not even aware of parts work or IFS spontaneously start doing some kind of parts work on MDMA. So there's a lot of synergy there. And yeah, I've noticed that IFS almost happens spontaneously on IFS, uh, on MDMA. And so I've done about four or five sessions over the last one year. And it's hard to attribute what changes were exactly caused by this because I was also simultaneously doing a lot of things. But 
yeah it's very clear that i probably achieved uh or i probably unburdened what otherwise would have taken me years to unburden hmm. what were those experiences on mdma like for you yeah and so the thing that stood out from the get go was how radically safe you feel in your own body it, it's like this very cliche description of coming home but it feels so real it feels that you're finally home and you feel so centered so grounded and at the same time it can also potentially get intense because what this safety net allows you to do is it allows you to access stuff that had been buried away deeply and so the first experience i was trying a bunch of different things i was trying ideal parent figure protocol i was trying to look at photographs from my childhood i was doing ifs i was going through my journals i was taking notes so yeah it was a bit random still very valuable experience but then i read a research paper called psychedelic somatic interactional psychotherapy something along those lines by the psychedelic somatic institute and it's a very interesting research paper and i recommend it to anyone who is experimenting with any kind of substance and they have a very different approach to working with these substances what they recommend is what they talk about is that your body knows how to heal itself it is much more intelligent than you are it knows much more than you do and if you try to consciously intervene in that process if you try to take it in a specific direction it disrupts the body's autonomic healing mechanisms so under the influence of these substances if you can just get out of the way and let the body do what it wants to do that the most optimal way of going about things and so in the subsequent mdma sessions that's the approach i took i just try to get out of the way to the best of my abilities and let the body do what it needs to do and yeah this unfolded in very interesting ways um i had a lot of involuntary movements and somatic release and which can look potentially terrifying from the outside like you are all over the place having all kinds of movements but yeah that felt like i was unburdening something very very deep and i was experiencing many felt shifts along the way so that has been my approach subsequently and it's it's kind of tricky to do that because we are not really good at getting out of our own way we are too clever for our own good sometimes and we try to direct the process in certain directions but yeah that's why uh i meditation also became even more important for me to be able to do this skillfully to get out of our own way and i noticed that this seems like the ideal approach to work with any kind of substance in general just letting the body do what it knows best is there any other advice that you'd give someone that was exploring mdma uh so harm reduction is specifically very important when it comes to mdma right uh, because it does have a relatively bad i wouldn't call it bad but relatively more risky safety profile and so being very precise about the dose being very rigorous about the supplementation before during after and giving your body adequate nourishment and rest before and after can go a long way in facilitating healing one thing that can get tricky is if you're not careful about this and if you end up putting a lot of load on your body the integration in the subsequent days becomes very difficult because the days the weeks following up after the mdma experiences are very crucial for integration and if during that period uh you are down and low it can you can end up losing a lot of the stuff that you got access to or integrating the stuff that would have otherwise gotten integrated and other than that yeah i believe 
meta also translates well to mdma knowing how to generate loving kindness or just staying with the loving kindness that is generating i think that's a very useful skill and it can help you get out of the way sometimes it can help you love the resistance if things are not working out and i think that's the most difficult part of just getting out of the way sometimes nothing is happening and we try to make something happen and that's where we go wrong uh, the idea is to stay with that nothingness and just staying with the resistance giving love to the resistance and just having faith that eventually something will click and it will all come up Are there any other substances that you've explored in your own journey? Yeah, so my introduction to altered states was LSD and it still remains my favorite substance despite uh, how much more powerful MDMA probably is. Uh, because one, it gave me a glimpse of what was possible. It expanded my possibility landscape and I had a very narrow outlook of the world of what was possible of what you could experience before my first lsd experience in 2017 and even though it was a very low dose experience it just this broke open the overton window for me and yeah got me really curious and obsessed about inner work and psychedelics and meditation in general and yeah in subsequent years i have experimented a lot with lsd and all kinds of doses all kinds of settings and it's a beautiful substance in what it enables uh, it allows you to take on experientially take on so many perspectives and embody like get an embodied sense of a lot of ideas and ways of being and it's also very powerful for healing but i feel that the real healing with lsd happens at uh, higher doses with classic psychedelics ha- happens with higher doses uh, and so what stan groff called the perinatal matrices i think if you are able to do high dose lsd experiences or mushroom experiences where you are able to explore that or even if you don't explore that getting a felt sense of something like non duality or infinite bliss or love anything like that can go a long way in your contemplative practice as well i like to use this metaphor where i talk about how we have an innate sense of rhythm that helps us play music or dance to music and similarly if we can get in a felt sense of non duality or of deep compassion that becomes a north star in our meditation practice and yeah then it becomes easier to move in that direction and deepen your practice so these are some of the things that have landed for me some of the many things through mm. working with these substances mm. how do you think about the sort of roles of contemplative practice um sort of self therapy or therapy modalities and these mm-hmm. substances like how do they fit together or which which is useful for what purpose in your view yeah 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 i can i have some perspectives but i am i don't i hold them all loosely but one thing that definitely makes a lot of sense for me is this threefold practices thing that romeo stevens has where the three pillars are integration insight and concentration so i feel mdma definitely fits in the integration side of things and it helps you do a lot of healing personal and relational it can help you do a lot of somatic releases as well and just get to a good baseline of emotional health which then unlocks your access to deeper concentration states which then leads to insights which again then feeds into integration and uh, i also feel that both mdma and psychedelics can also make concentration easier for you like uh, uh, how i mentioned 
if you have a felt sense of these deeper states that you're trying to move towards, it becomes easier to move towards them. And yeah, so that's one way. I also feel that similarly, if you have an experiencing experiential felt sense of certain insights, maybe like emptiness, um, again, hasn't landed for me yet. But if you have a felt sense of the inherent emptiness in everything through psychedelics, which I think is very much possible, it's easier to reaccess that insight in your meditation states. I feel that a lot of similar insights have landed for me in psychedelic states, which became more apparent in my meditative practices. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, how do you see those relating to the therapy and self-therapy modalities? Oh yeah, uh, I think that would also fall in the integration side of things. If you can work with, so what I think is uh, a lot of people try to, including me, try to get into this circle at the concentration path and that can be a difficult thing to do if your mind is filled with a lot of unnecessary thoughts and a lot of bullshit and so it can be potentially very hard to achieve deeper states of concentration if you're constantly emotionally struggling and it can also be potentially unsafe to try to access deeper concentration states without knowing how to work through some of your trauma because it can come up and you might be ill-equipped to deal with that thing. So a good place to start, at least for me and for many other people I know has been working with these therapeutic modalities and practices to work through trauma and baggage and get certain affordances, which also translate well to a sitting meditation practice like how IFS lands itself very well to meta, which you can then use to attain jhanas. So yeah, something along those lines. I feel that since universally trauma is such a universal thing, if we can initially work through some emotional baggage, concentration and insight might become more accessible, but yeah, mm-hmm. I'm very early on the path to give definite answers. Mm -hmm. yeah that model definitely makes sense of a lot of the difficulties that I faced early in my own practice and like Uh yeah starting with like basically concentration practices and having such difficulty with it and uh, I think that a lot started to get unlocked for me as I started to focus more on healing for a time and using these modalities Mm -hmm. because uh, there was sort of like a cleaning up to do yeah 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 Definitely makes sense. Well, we've covered a lot of territory. Uh, Is there anything else that you'd like to say more about or talk more about? Yeah, um, I would love for us to talk more about healing and attachment theory in general, because I've Mm. I've seen you also talk about it and I feel like it's the most important stuff when it comes to healing in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we could talk about that. Sure, sure. What have your own experiences with uh, learning and practicing attachment theory been yeah uh so my attachment disturbances became very apparent to me in my relational in my relationships and so inadvertently i made it a top priority to heal those attachment disturbances because it was the thing that was causing me the most trouble at that point in my life but i noticed that attachment goes beyond just relationships right Uh, it also shapes our worldview and it also shapes how we think about the world in general, reality in general. If you felt safe in your childhood, if your parents were a safe place, the world also feels like a safe place. But if that was not the case, the world can feel like an unsafe place and that can shape your worldview and approach to life in many different ways. And for me personally, I have an anxious attachment style and I for a period of my life, I got really obsessed with trying to heal that. And yeah, I believe that I have unburdened so much stuff in that area. And I think that has 
move the biggest needle for me. I also feel that uh, trauma happens or the trauma we accumulate happens in a layered way. And what happened in the initial, year, initial years from age zero to two, where you were the most vulnerable you are, I think that lays down the foundation for almost everything else that happens in your life. And it makes you vulnerable to a certain things. And then when that vulnerability exists, how the nature of life is, other traumas layers on, layers on top of that. So I believe that working with this oldest, deepest rooted stuff is perhaps the most important in healing journey. And it's kind of difficult because one, it's so deeply buried. Two, uh, our narrative memory system is not really live during the age zero to two. So we have no memory of what happened, just visceral feelings in our body. And so it's tricky to work with that, but yeah, I think IFS also lends well to attachment stuff. And I think ideal parent figure protocol can also be integrated with IFS to help heal attachment disturbances. And yeah, I think again, MDMA is specifically very useful at healing relational disturbances. Hmm. So yeah, that's definitely very helpful. Hmm. And yeah, eventually I think relational wounds will heal in relational containers. So along with this inner work, doing just going out there and exposing yourself to hurt plays a big role in healing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious mm -hmm. to hear about your exploration of attachment theory and how that has affected the rest of your healing journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it has a lot of explanatory power and just noticing that, um, yeah, I tend towards having anxious attachment as well. Although I think, um, I remember I saw a study some time ago, uh, like four or five years ago that was talking about how we often actually present differently in different relationships or different situations. And there was sort of this yeah. quiz that you could take about like what attachment style showed up in certain major relationships in your life, like a boss mm -hmm. and a partner and like a parent and a close friend. And I was like, yeah. oh, I actually have different uh, sort of like attachment relationships with yeah. these people. And um, but yeah, I think it's had just a lot of explanatory power for me in terms of understanding mm -hmm. myself and understanding other people. and. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that I've fully healed my attachment wounding, but uh, yeah. it's been just such a helpful frame. And, you know, the related techniques of ideal parent figure have definitely also been very helpful. Yeah, 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 I feel you. I definitely feel, feel you on healing it fully. I think it's healing generally happens in a fractal way, right? You heal 80% and then you try to heal the 80% of the remaining 20% and so on. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think it's an infinite journey towards like towards which you can only asymptote. Yes. But yeah, uh, I think this, all, this is also very important in general about healing that there's always stuff. There will always be stuff and stuff will always continue to come up. But yeah, it's very much worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you um, doing ideal parent figure meditations? Uh, I have very little experience with doing ideal parent figure meditations. I mm -hmm. I tried some of the guided meditations. I'm forgetting the name, but on the website attachmentrepair.com. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, they have a lot of their meditations uploaded on the Insight Timer app and I tried some of those. And I tried some Ideal Parent stuff in IFS. Uh, oh yeah, uh, I Ideal Parent Figure Protocol worked really well for me uh, during when I tried the combination of LSD and MDMA. It was like this, I had this enhanced imaginal powers of LSD and this radical love of MDMA. Mm. And I did not really plan to do ideal parent figure stuff. 
during that trip i plan to take this that similar approach of just getting out of the way and letting the body mind do its thing and what happened for me was i spontaneously started doing ideal parent type stuff for myself memories were coming up for me and i was intuitively being the ideal parent for the younger versions of me or creating those ideal parents and so i think the ideal parent figure protocol can work especially well in this combination yeah mm-hmm. yeah i think um i'm getting the sense as you talk about that about like just all i think practicing these sort of different techniques and different modalities and frameworks and stuff is really helpful but it's almost like um building certain muscles or skill sets and then when it's sort of actually yeah time to do the work that's very improvisational and like different things oh, yeah. blend together and um yeah 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 and so this reminds me of this section in mark lipman's meditation protocol which is about auxiliary or preliminary practices and he has like 900 plus auxiliary practices in there briefly described uh, and the idea is that if you have access to these various affordances whatever works for you you have to find what works for you stuff like unblending from a part is one affordance noticing your body sensations is one affordance and if you can build an arsenal of many of these affordances it gives you a certain degree of like it gives you a high degree of freedom and precision that can then translate into your healing journey and meditation practice both definitely definitely hmm. is there anything else you'd like to share or talk about yeah nothing off the top of my head i think we covered a lot of ground yeah Well, thank you so much for speaking with me and uh it's been really a pleasure to hear about your own journey and the the sort of sessions that you facilitated and yeah keep up the good work with that I'm I'm really glad you're out there doing that. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk about my journey and my practice. I'm really grateful for that.